welcome to the DTFH. Oh, fuck. This episode. Man, this one, this one got me. You know, Emil Amos has been on the show many times. He's actually one of the most requested guests of the DTFH. Uh, and I love talking to him, but this one reminded me of how intense a person he is and how wild it is that I got to be friends with him. We went really deep. Uh, and it to me, what's really ironic about that is that initially we wanted to plug an, a tape of prank calls that we're releasing. It's coming out on Monday. Uh, and it's got it's like the longest, most philosophical discussion to get to, and we want you to buy our prank call tapes. It's ridiculous, but um, we do. I want you to check out Insidious Mind Control, which is going to be available on Bandcamp. You can find the links at duncantrussell.com uh, or just Google Insidious Mind Control. On Monday, we're dropping it. I hope you will check it out. It's a cassette tape, so you're going to need a tape player. I think on Bandcamp, you probably get the an MP3 or something, but get a fucking tape player. That way you can really get the prank call experience. Also, if you're coming to any of my shows, I'm going to be selling them there too. So, Insidious Mind Control, order it, especially if today's Monday. If it's not, you can't get it yet. And please welcome back to the DTFH. Brilliant musician of some of my favorite bands ever. Holy Sons, Grails, and also... One of my dearest friends, lifetime friends, Emil Amos. What up, B? Welcome back to the show. Feels good to be here. Dude, we've got a fucking huge announcement to make. This has been in the works now for, oh, I mean, I guess you could say over two decades if you really think about it, but. Yeah, maybe, maybe almost 30 or something. Almost 30 years has been in the works. <laughs> uh and, you know, this is something I, I think we may have talked about a little bit in the mini podcast that we've done together. But when we were in college, we, and I'm still a little confused about how it even happened, started making prank calls and recording them using a handheld tape recorder that you would hold up to the phone and that somehow actually got the audio in a way where you could hear it which that to me is one of the weirdest parts about it it's like how the fuck did that work totally agree i think about that uh often when i'm editing it i'm like were phones way louder back then were, 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 were we using a speaker phone i don't think they had that in the dorms they didn't have that yeah so that was the one thing that was really strange is that I mean, it was already strange that we decided to start doing prank calls. But what was really weird is that we could then share the calls we made with people in the school. And I think that was probably my it was definitely my first taste of making something and like in some infinitely microscopic way, publishing it and it would make people laugh. And remember how thrilling that was like. People would like professors started playing it to their students in their <laughs> class. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if you go back to the the line that I guess it'd be good to ask you where it came from, but the, that line you said a couple podcasts ago, the uh, music turns victims into heroes. I mean, we're kind of diagramming the birth of you flipping your own script like that, right? Right. Yeah, right. Like taking this, like, trait that definitely probably isn't that good like the some ability to manipulate a lack of any kind of sense of like this pro I should, probably shouldn't do this you know sociopathic traits I guess you would say and then like realizing like oh my god that you can like m make something really funny using these traits that and, and also, it wasn't just that. I mean, it, that, the other thing that I think was really great about these calls is that we didn't have any reason for doing them other than it was making us <laughs> laugh. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely, you said recently you used to 
leave my room feeling acutely guilty. And at the time, you definitely battled some guilt. But then afterwards, too, for years when we when we speculated on how do you release these, like how do you package them, like what, who, you know, how do we want to present them? I mean, all through the years, you know, we do all these long distance phone calls uh, in the early days because because really as a struggling comedian in the early 2000s, you didn't really have any um, content yet. So like if you had a manager or something, people would be like, what do you have? And you'd be like, well, I have these calls. And so we would go over it sometimes. We'd be like, what are we going to do with the fucking calls there? To us, they were in a few other people. They were legendary. And I think that... uh, at some point, I, I mean, you kind of relieved yourself of the guilt, but all those years, I remember you feeling really conflicted about if they were mean spirited or not. But for me, who is just in the room laughing, recording mm-hmm. them, I, I never really felt like they were mean spirited at all. They, they, there's moments that are off color, like there's nobody ever has their feelings hurt you can kind of tell that like i think the only like controversial thing is that you've like possibly possibly woken someone up at a hotel once like because it was no you didn't even wake them up but it was late you know but stuff like that like those were the ethical lines crossed but yeah all in all i would Hmm. say they're they're actually pretty kind but you battled with yourself i'd say for years and and now you know, we look back and and uh, it's kind of the good old days, you know. Well, also, I, I just don't like like ethical comedy. You know what I mean? It, it like there's a re- it's like too it's like wet fire. You know, it's like two two <laughs> things that just don't go together or work well together. And maybe and 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 you can you know you see attempts at it anytime you see some kind of moralizing by a talk show host who's supposed to be funny or a comedian who's supposed to be funny or god forbid a political commercial is trying to be funny and it rarely hits it's, it's kind of like you know christian rock you know mm-hmm. what i mean like mm-hmm. it, it they, you you can try it but most of the time it just doesn't hit right like it feels off you know and um yeah, so I think that was probably like my first taste of sort of reckoning with like, well, if you want to be funny, you have to like surrender to a not a mean-spirited attitude, but a, a sort of chaotic r- relationship with existence that isn't weighed down by your like whatever you think is right or wrong. Right, that's that's like totally a fascinating way to get into this subject because as you recently told me, see, I never knew how you thought of yourself when you got to school. I just saw you as most people viewed you from the outside, which was, you know, an eccentric um, form of outsider in, in your in your own way. Um, but you were telling me recently you didn't really think of yourself that way. So you, you were sort of like, or at least you were trying to escape some of your eccentricities and like jump into this world of normality th- by way of college. Right. I didn't know any of that stuff. I, I, I it still to me, that's kind of shocking. Like I'm fascinated by that idea, but if it's true that you got to school because you wanted to join the workforce and kind of, uh, you know, become Settle a professional down. working person. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, then, you know, then I was kind of like a portal person. I was, my room was a portal. The calls were a portal, but, but as you stepped through that, well, cause you, you, you of, you're like, you were the first actual like artist, especially recording artist that I ever met. Like, cause this was before YouTube, this is before social media. So like, obviously you knew there's, there were people out there who would, play music as a job or there was like a way to to record songs but also back then the audio technology is just was infinitely far away from where it is now so if you did want to record music you needed like gear right and Mm -hmm. then the whole thing just like in high school I think some of my friends formed a band and 
that was about as close as I'd ever come to like being around anyone trying to like make songs. And so this, so I met you and you're not just making music. You're making this beautiful music that I listen to to this day. And so like, I, like I was mind blown by the whole thing. Like it just seemed like, uh, insane the whole, whatever you were which i wasn't really quite sure of back then just seemed like really crazy to me and also you i think made me feel normal normal you know what i mean <laughs> like you made me feel like um like i was the one who's like dude this dude like you gotta watch out for him because like whatever he the fuck he's up to ain't good like and and but then we would take ass together it's <laughs> and it's true like i never realized that until we had that conversation lately how like the i guess my fantasy had been somehow that you know you can hang up your eccentricities whenever you want like there 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 is a way to assimilate if you wanted to you could like sort mm -hmm. of fly outside the default reality but when it's time to get back in you could get back in. You could just fit right back in with them again and, and mix in the way that people around you seem to just normally mix in or something. I don't know. You know that, have you ever had that fantasy? Whew. Uh, I don't know if I was ever so privileged to believe that would work out, but, um, but I had a huge head start. Like everything we were doing in that room and on those acid trips in the woods or whatever, um, I had a huge head start from from a very early age. I, I've talked about it a million times, but you can't underestimate uh, the fact that uh, getting into like hardcore, meeting my guru, being into skateboarding, those are all things where you like already threw out normality early on, 12 years old. You just threw it all out. And, and in the end, uh, some people are lucky to make correlations between all those subcultures and Buddhism or something right. of a, of a sort of greater umbrella of that requires a throwing out normality, you know, to get to sort of right. like the gist of the core concept. And so, so because I'd had that big, uh, head start by the time I met you, I probably felt kind of old, almost like washed up. You know, <laughs> I, I was kind of like, I mean, that was this sullen look that you, you you've reported. But Okay. Wait, here's the, okay. Have. Yes. But to get to the soul and look, it is like that's another thing about you is like you were growing up during like one, like a boom, a mu an insane music mm -hmm. boom in Chapel Hill because mm -hmm. Chapel Hill was having this crazy indie rock thing happening mm -hmm. and all these insane yeah. bands were coming through. And like there was not just like you're around people making music, but you're around people who went on to become like famous and certainly in North Carolina you've got what do you got fucking REM Archers of Loaf who, who else what were the other bands that were? REM came through and are affiliated with the DBs for sure and and let's active but but what you're talking about sounds to maybe like a, a layman or, or like somebody just drifting through this podcast what you're talking about sounds just like kind of shallowly anthropological but it's not shallow at all it like what you're saying goes back to a huge part of the way our friendship came together in the sense that you were coming from Hendersonville. We never talk about the difference between Hendersonville and Chapel Hill, right. but that was fucking massive because in a sense I cheated, you know, I got shown all this right. stuff at age 10, 11, 12 and sat on stage with Fugazi and stuff running to get him water. You know, I got to see this stuff in the very, very front row as a small child and so when we came together um the there was kind of a beautiful aspect is that is that you didn't necessarily need to have those backgrounds to have that complexity within inside you that kind of correlated with what where i was coming from too and so then you cheated you know you, we both like kind of like cut corners spiritually with a kind of what i like to call sometimes like a spiritual greed you know you want to you want more than yeah. what you're seeing you yeah. know and because we both had that kind of lust for learning you know it, it's like it's like we we glued together and because i had that four track sitting there and i had this music ritual and you didn't yet have 
your little space, your little void that you were going to fill with something creative. We we created the calls for you to have a ritualistic practice. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a cool way to look at it. Yeah. And 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 yeah, that that um so yeah, the so these calls um were like you know, us like figuring out something. And I also I don't you think that that wrestling with like this a sense of guilt or a feeling of like what the fuck have I done? Isn't that maybe a sign you're making something cool? Like when you get you know what I mean? Like that sense of like, ooh, I don't some some podcasts. I'm like, mm-hmm. damn, I don't know if I should put that up. A feeling of like, oh fuck, man, I don't know. You know, it, it's not some sense of like, this is great. It's a feeling of like, whoa, I, I don't know if what what we talked about. And I don't mean in some kind of like politically correct way. I just mean like shit, man. Like I don't know if I, I don't know what we're doing there. What are we summing up? You know what I mean? Like what? Have we, and that's the other thing is like certain people in my life. You're obviously one of them. When I get around them, something gets summoned up that isn't me and isn't them. It's something in between, and 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 that thing is so unique and sometimes sinister in the coolest way ever. Where you're like. You know, if you're challenged, if you're with a real friend and you're, you know, you have spiritual greed and you're really interested in exploring what other people might think of as like esoteric, dangerous, even, uh, then like your job, it's not like your job, but you're just naturally going to push each other in a good way towards like whatever it is you're exploring. And inevitably, someone will ju- swim a little further out in the pool first. You know, and then be like, huh, well, you want to swim out a little further? And you're like, I don't know. And but you do. And then, you know, that's kind of the progression, I think, of like any any good friendship that, that has like a, the game of like, like I don't want to say philosophy, but why not? Like it, 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 that's one of the games in the friendship. Yeah, certainly. I mean, again, back to like the beginnings of, of music and, and getting to sort of like had this peak experience in Chapel Hill. I mean, the first, metaphorically, the first um, difficult music that I heard, um, which eventually became, you know, hardcore sort of transformed into lo-fi by way of things like Sabato, but but, um, that difficult music, the first time you heard it, I'm just speaking like kind of for everybody, you never liked it the first time. Right. Right. Ever. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, like, like yeah. people don't realize no one likes this shit the first time. Right. You know what I mean? And and it, and it, that needs to be said more often to let more people through this kind of elitist gate. You know? Yeah. But um, but so then I got to see you experience that in real time. But but I had already been through all that stuff where where at first I felt very uncomfortable intimidated all those all those feelings everybody feels when they start hearing outsider music or or music for like really small subcultures you have to acclimate and that's not unlike metaphorically you know acid or levels of buddhism or levels of the masons there's always acclimations right and so yeah picture somebody that is like hitting their head up against the ceiling of a level of development and they're like, oh, that next one, as you're talking about the deep end of the pool, that next level of development is just too uncomfortable for me. And then they make almost a conscious decision to just stop evolving. Right. 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 And and which, which is a nut, which they don't even realize. Like, that's just another d- deep end of the motherfucking pool. It's just a different kind of deep end. Now you're playing around with entropy. You're playing around with mediocrity but because you have decided not to go further in you have like you you have you you've wrought this thing on you've brought it onto yourself that's the and i do think this is why in most grimoires even in some like spiritual like buddhist stuff i've read there is a a a thing at the beginning that says listen don't fucking do it like Mm -hmm. if you are if you if you haven't already started down the path don't go because this is the best time to not go. Because once you start going down, if you you're not going to get to go back, like you can't go back, you can't go to go fall asleep again in the way you wanted to fall asleep. And also, this is why I think if there was why there why secret societies or whatever you want to call them, 
um, or, or, or initi initiatory mm -hmm. um, forms of like ritualistic spirituality would have a place where you really have to ask to come in and you have to mean it. And mm. you know what I mean? Where, where, where you can't, and, and whoever is like letting people in has to be good enough to recognize people who mean it and people who don't mean it because of compassion, not some insidious, dark, like th power hungry thing, but just more like, look, if, if the best, Mitzi would always just like the best thing that could happen is uh, somebody realizes comedy isn't for them. Best thing mm -hmm. is to realize like now nah, I don't want to be a stand up comic because it's, it's such an insane life and so unpredictable and, and so fraught with imminent failure or meteoric uh, decline or all the things like you have to really want to do it uh, and not pretend you want to do it or you're really going to have a, a rough time. Uh, and similarly with this sort of stuff I think we're talking about, it's like the, the, the westernized capitalist version of it would imply that upon setting out on the spiritual path, it's just smooth sailing, baby. You're going to be friendly and nice to everybody and sweet, and you're not going to suffer, and the sorrow will diminish, and all the that bullshit, like, it, it, because you don't, you can't sell. Like, listen, this thing you're about to get engaged in is really going to fucking, like, fuck you up for a while maybe for this whole incarnation there's no guarantees who knows what's gonna happen but if you if the thing that that is the the selling point is not something you just get to have but it's like any other fucking thing like if you want to learn i don't know jujitsu or something you don't just get to just practice and you get good at jujitsu you have to fucking like get your ass kicked <laughs> like there's no way you got to wrestle with people and get your ass kicked to get better whatever the fucking thing is with stand up you're going to eat shit up there man you're going to bomb and be humiliated and that's just part of it you know so i think it's similar god damn sorry I've, for that i've rant. thought about that uh i've thought about that thing you've you've said a few times about the turn back now thing and i've repeated it a couple times and um I mean, the the idea of that is pretty facetious, though, right? Because you can't, no one can turn back karmically, right? I mean, it's, you you have no will to be able to turn back, like it's spiritually, it, if yeah. that's your destiny. Well, the the so in the Bhagavad Gita, the, the the question is, you know, what happens if I fall away from the path? Will I drift like a cloud? I always say this on this podcast. So I'm sorry, you guys. I just love it. And Krishna's response is, there is no loss or diminution on this path. Any, you know, if you fall away from the path in this lifetime, you will be given birth in a family in a, of disciplined men, which is weird. Like, how do they start a family? But the 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 you you will be born like in the way that you were very introduced to this, like to art early. That would be looked upon as like, well, in the previous incarnation, you didn't achieve awakening. You still are locked on the samsaric wheel, but. Because of your good karma, you were given birth in a place where you would be exposed to something that would set you on the path sooner this time. And in the in the in the premium good karma would be you were born into a family where you you from the moment you you can like hear and see you're being wow. introduced to the thing. And then you get the ultimate head start. So when like people are always bitching about like Nepo babies or whatever, from the perspective of the Gita, actually mm -hmm. those people have been like on this creative arc for lifetimes. And, and, and their karma was to be an actor or whatever the fuck. It's not always a spiritualist. It's like what it, whatever your particular fixation is would determine your next birth. And if the fixation is on something, you know, spiritual or whatever you want to call it then that's that will determine your next birth so eventually you don't have to keep getting fucking born just a grind This episode has been supported by Reunion. Reunion offers seven-day all-inclusive ayahuasca or psilocybin retreats. Y'all are so lucky. I didn't have this when I was coming up. You couldn't go to some 
fancy resort, hang out with shamans, have doctors around if you needed them, eat great food, get massages during your like exploration of hyperspace. No, you'd go to the Blue Ridge Mall, you'd sit on a fucking bench, and you'd watch mall walkers melt into the floor, and you'd get scared, and that was your day. But you guys, wow, the fact these things even exist is, I think, a really good sign. And as much as psychedelics have benefited me over time, I, I, I can't imagine what it's like to add to the experience guidance and a general sense of safety, healing. Like, wow, the war on drugs, man. Got a lot of us paranoid. A lot of us have the fear inside of us. And I, I, to this day, like, I don't even know, like, if there's a way for me to, like, remove the weird paranoia that can come over you because of the propaganda we all got from the war on drugs whenever I take some kind of plant medicine. But I would imagine that a place like Reunion could help you with that, along with other things. It's luxury mixed in with exploration of the self healing and diving safely into the psychedelic waters that are calling you. Reunion's highly experienced facilitation team has a wealth of medical, therapeutic, and shamanic experience, and they keep groups small to ensure everyone has personalized support. Your physical, emotional, and psychological safety is always prioritized with an on-site licensed medical clinic a complete intake process, and 24-7 safety team. That is so cool, man. That is so cool. I have never had a bad trip where there's a medical clinic I could go to. You just stuff it down, man. You just stuff it down. It's like, you guys, I should go. Go to reunionexperience.org to book a discovery call, secure your spot, and learn more about plant medicine. And for our dear listeners, use code DUNCAN during registration to save $250 off your plant medicine retreat at reunionexperience.org. Dive in. Go deeper. Go to Reunion. Thank you, Reunion. Hare Krishna. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great idea. I, it, it's either way too poetic and too convenient, or or possibly true. Um, Both. But let me ask you this uh, professional question: Does it seem like I have this friend that was uh, on tour? I think he was cooking for Neil Young, and he ended up being like. Uh, sort of like waiting for a plane one day with Neil Young and, and, and getting to know him a little bit. And I was like, what's he like? You know, whatever you ask, you know? And, um, he was like, wow, he is really grumpy. <laughs> and I just thought to myself, uh, is this, is this our destiny? Like, like all of our idols are these like infinitely like legendary grumpy old men. And like it was the same with John Casey, who was who is our great sort of Taoist teacher in college, um, the most laid back guy, the most uh, understanding, the most on the level, the most chill in so many fucking ways, but also super fucking grumpy. Hey, you ever been around a dying person? They're fucking grumpy sometimes, mm. man. And or like you would you would you translate it as grumpy, but it's like you're fucking dying, and it's like they don't. You know, small talk becomes a real different thing when you probably have like a few days to live. Right. You want to spend that that amount of time, like you know, pacifying somebody's fear of your demise. You know, mm. or, or or not telling the truth. You're you're school's out, man. You're about to fucking have a an, some kind of break, maybe an infinite one. But but regard, you know what I mean. So I think probably it's like that, right? Like. You know the old, the grumpy old person thing. Are they are they really grumpy, or are they just not putting up with your bullshit? 
right? Like they just don't have time. Like, and, and maybe with people like Neil Young, Jesus, mm-hmm. man, think of the fucking just shotgun blast of bullshit he had to endure being like Neil Young. Like how many fucking, like, how, like at first people are coming up to you and like, man, your music changed my life. And you love it. And, but then people are coming up to you and saying that. And now you realize I've got to do like at least 10 or 20 minutes of listening to this person compliment me. And if I don't listen and engage in a full way, then they're going to think I'm an asshole. But really, I just don't want to, I want to talk like a normal person for a second. I'd like to get out of that as soon as possible. And then mix into it all the people trying to grift, trick him, wrote us, hey, Neil. Hey, man, let me send you some lyrics I wrote for you, man. It's called Yellow Hay in the Wagon. You know, and you're like, oh, dude, I don't want your fucking lyrics, man. Please. And then you know what I mean? And you just you start getting real and real uh, uh, tuned into bullshit. Right. So like the, the chef is like he's real fucking grumpy. But we mm. got it. I'd like to see like some conversations on the tour bus with the chef. With Neil Young, right, where he's trying to write a fucking song, and the chef maybe is like, you know, just being nice, but like, I don't know, you know what I mean? That, or, that's the, or no, Neil that's Young's great. a grumpy piece of fucking shit. I don't know. <laughs> I think I met him once. Oh yeah. Yeah, because like I, I, mean, I, I, I don't know how much I could talk about it. Honestly, it wouldn't be fair. But like, there's a place in some part of the country that supposedly he would go to under a pseudonym. Mm. And I'm 99% certain it was him. What and, a trip! And I and and I was I was with, I was on um, MDMA. No and I, way! And I think he knew I recognized him, and I was wearing a shirt, a, a hat that said "I love Jesus" or something, some hipster <laughs> bullshit. And I remember he walked up to us in the hot tub, and he's like, "You believe you believe what's on your hat?" No fucking way! Yeah, and like I, uh, I'm like I do, and. He seemed awesome, and he knew that I, I think he must have known I knew who he was. And, but then I was like, what's your name? And he, like, I don't know, gave a different name. So maybe it wasn't him, but sure as fuck looked like him. It's in the exact spot that people said he would go to, and he seemed like exact, I mean, seemed like it was probably him. And he didn't That's seem grumpy. So he just funny. seemed, he seemed like uh, um, sparkly in the way, like, I don't know, people like John Casey were. You know, sparkly mm-hmm. dangerous or something. Sparkly, mm-hmm. like, like, I don't know. But I, I could be wrong. Totally. Could yeah. have been just some dude. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, there is something, there's something to those two people. There's something to the, the those people who have seen what they've seen. And, um, and there's also something to, like, that precipice or whatever you want to call it. Uh, when the husband carries the woman over the, what's it called? Like over the, over the, into the doorway, you know. Threshold. About, yeah, the Thanks, threshold, Josh. right? The pr- the precipice of the threshold, there's something about how you came into my room and you, you sort of broke through a fear barrier and then we sort of, we sort of landed the trick or something, you know, and you sort of were like, oh shit, like this works out. You know, someone said the deep end of the pool isn't, isn't so bad you know you're not gonna die and then and then you walked away from it eventually i mean sort of taking a bit of a pact with the dark lord metaphorically because you because you sort of started to maybe see your your path towards normality in a bigger context right and you sort of put that that aspiration away a little bit for sure yeah absolutely man and the the and and like there was a kind of like I don't know a way that I think we were looking at the world, which is a really good way to look at the world, a way of being in the world. It's kind of spontaneous and naturally makes you an outsider. If it's a world of planning and a world of like strategizing and a world of like, you know, careerism or whatever, there's another, you know, a lot of outsiders that you run into. And I don't just mean like artists, you know, travelers, you know, when you run into travelers, it's always cool. Like the people who are living in their fucking vans are always like, you know, traveling in weird parts of the world and they, they don't, they haven't anchored themselves to any real home and to, and they've been traveling so much that they don't even like have that in their heads anymore. You know what I'm talking about? Those travelers mm-hmm. you run into mm-hmm. traveling, man, you run into them 
And uh, uh, yeah, like the way they're living is kind of like it wouldn't maybe it wouldn't work so well in the norm in the in the default reality world. Like you wouldn't be able to quite pull it off. You know, that yeah. that thing. And and I think like that to me was like the fantasy was that I would be able to like change the way I was interacting with reality to where suddenly I was satisfied with just a normal schedule and and no and in some sense of knowing what's around the corner in a year or two and four oh one Ks and all that shit. Like, you know, that well, that's it that sort I, of implies that you also like had an inborn sense of guilt already or or some sort of fear already that you were gonna like slide back into some hole of your own um your own evil you know what i mean it's like it's like you showed up and you had this sort of like war or thing playing out between you and then like as as i've known you i mean it's it's very clear that you've worked through m a lot of it. I mean, where you are now to me, the, sort of like with your like your emphasis on neutrality, like in the past couple few years, yeah. um, it just seems so different than the person I met in a certain calmer way. Uh, and I think, thanks. Yeah, and I yeah happier. That was the word I was using back then, happy. But I, what I meant was kind of like weirdly i kind of meant beyond good and evil too that's that's kind of what i meant and i feel like when i was sitting in your room one time and i was you had some some random girls from your dorm just happened to be in your room and and i had said to them you know i had said to, to this one girl that i was that i was finally happy you know and that yeah. and that 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 within that reality or something maybe it rubs up against the world in a funny way or, or something I was describing something about the quality of happiness and she was like I don't think you're happy at all I mean look at your face you know look at look at the way you are like yeah, around right. campus or something and it was interesting because it was one of those first times where someone was like your happiness is not the way I've been told happiness looks Dude, that, yeah. your happiness pissed a lot of people off. Like that it happy thing, we were, we, I hate, I didn't like it. Like, <laughs> you know, but and, and really, cause like that to me was also like in retrospect, thinking about how you figured out that if you tell people you're happy, that can really <laughs> anger somebody. And I got and, into it. Yeah. And almost like they are inviting them to challenge you. Like you mm -hmm, want to get mm -hmm. into an argument about whether you're happy or not. You want and 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 also the I don't think you're happy thing is actually sinister because in the I don't think you're happy is actually let me try to make you miserable like me. I right, I, right. I want to pull you into my hell. You got right. out of hell. I want to get you back in here. And and so you're not fitting into anything that happiness looks like. Yeah, dude, that was that is, um, yeah that that is a really funny thing uh, regarding happiness itself i mean the 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 the, the word is quite confusing anyway and also yeah, i think is. what most people imagine it is or or what you you know if you were to just sort of do an essay on happiness and you're only allowed to watch commercials <laughs> you know mm -hmm. think of what you would write to define <laughs> happiness and that's what the transactional corporatist world just shoves down your fucking throat happiness is that look on your face when you're driving down the fucking beautiful forest road in your new Range Rover with your <laughs> wife who is now fine with your bullshit. That's happiness. You know, like the, the thing, right. the thing itself uh, or, or happiness is a kind of like, it's a high that never goes away. You get into this, some kind of state of like, dude, I did it. I plugged all the cords into the mm -hmm. right fucking holes. Mm -hmm. And now this, this thing that was transient, fleeting, rare is a constant reality for me at every waking moment. That's the f happy fantasy when it's mm -hmm. like, if you look at happiness or th the times you're really fucking happy, you know, from that perspective, you're never <laughs> happy. Yeah. I think I don't there was never anything sarcastic about using that word to me. I, I, maybe I was reclaiming the word like when, you know, you steal back the word from 
you know, uh, uh, the wrong connotation, you reuse it in, in a new way or something. But, but I think that um, I, I have to speculate that one reason why I really felt happy and, and called it being happy was that um, I kind of got through the major arc of, of the worst suffering of my life and came out on the other side and looked at the world and started to see sort of how the world works in a way that I wouldn't, I wasn't taking things personally. It wasn't about me. I was just starting to look at the thing as an organism, mm. and I felt very freed up by that. And I was, um, I felt impartial to it. You know, it was like it was like a, it was like a type of feeling enlightened uh, in the neutral sense. I was not really. It wasn't my script, and I mm. felt like sort of like totally freed up from all the suffering I had gone through before. What was that what suffering? What, what do you think that was? Well, I mean, certainly the bad side of greed, certainly the bad side of, of ego lust and all, all the things where you try, you try to win or you feel yourself losing all the things that you, you, you go through when you become t terribly selfish, you know, just mm. all the things, all yeah. the stages of selfishness yeah. that cause you, the most acute sort of petty misery, I suppose. I mean, all, all those forms of growing up that you have to burn through. Yeah. You know, those are just things that need to happen. And that's why I think it's okay to call it something like spiritual greed, because you've got to get going down the track. You've got to get going towards uh, some form of evolution. And if you're just fine, if you just, if you think this, this society is just a fucking blast, then you may not get going down the evolutionary track because you you're just having a, such a good time. Yeah, you know what I mean. There's you have to have some some reason to try to absolve a knot. To you have to have some sort of problem to get going, right? Right. And uh, I think that I think that when you encounter like you did, like you're describing this encountering this kind of dark horse, you know, this kind of sullen person at first which is exactly how it was um because we changed together side by side we 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 went through all these these changes and i think the way a person who is kind of like trained in the baby into the pool the way they show you like don't go over there and they you know yeah. they give you the basic rules and the codes and and all the things you're supposed to be afraid of you know strangers crack rock all these things like you yeah you internalize that stuff and then when you encounter somebody who um you can see is like existing in a in a bit of a beyond good and evil uh sort of biosphere right. what what yeah. you would call it space then yeah. then you're then you're like then your warning signs start getting Fuck yeah, ticked they do. off you're right? not following you're, the same rules as me man you know mm -hmm. whatever like you're you're not you're not playing the game by the rules and you you can if you're also on top of that saying that this non-participation in the rules that we've all been taught to adhere to is making you happy do you <laughs> fuck you you're supposed to be in hell now you didn't follow the rules you should be miserable and yet somehow you are happy and because you actually are happy you know there's a difference between saying i'm happy when you're not which is by the way like one of the cultural traditions of the day <laughs> exactly. that right. just that's the new lo is lying that you're happy uh you 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 or i guess conversely like you know expressing that you're miserable but your misery is being caused because of your compassion or some bullshit you know you your misery is a result of your <laughs> sensitivity to have the suffering of the world you know which is another awesome deception but either way to like meet someone who is not getting rolled by the suffering of the world and is able to look at the world in a neutral way is fucked up if you haven't like if you if if you have really been like working hard you know to follow the rules and and well, and, it, and it and it scares people dude it, it's scary and 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 it and it implies like they could kill me and not care mm -hmm. i think it implies not only they could create some grave uh you know, violent act against me, which is, which is by the way, true. Mm -hmm. 
because you because the person is not living by your code yep. right so so the, the the warning signs are real and and then uh, on the back end of it too like if you actually start to be seduced by their frequency then it could mean that you've grown up in a cult and you and they're suggesting that you are deluded you know and you are lost within the the, the labyrinth of this cult that's trained you mm-hmm. and that's got to be super fucking depressing too Oh my god! Yeah, well, I mean, you you were you're so you're, it's just like, God, it you know, I'll quote Neil Young. Oh, to live on Sugar Mountain with the Barkers <laughs> and the color balloons. You can't be twenty on Sugar Mountain. Oh, you're thinking that you're leaving there too soon. You know, you're on Sugar Fucking Mountain. Literally, right. Sugar Mountain. Everyone's eating fucking sugar. Poisoning yeah. yourself culturally, traditionally poisoning yourself. You're like, you're, you're, you, you, you've not, you have not only been trained to sort of eat shitty food and buy into a kind of like concept of like a finish line before you die where you will be happy. That's what the movies show you for the credits roll. And, but, but, but also you, you're, you're miserable. Because all of it's a fucking lie, you know, and, and you're and you've caught on it's a lie, in in an emotional, instinctual way, but you start thinking, well, I must be miserable right now because of my net lack of adherence to the rules, or because I haven't gotten to the finish line yet. You know, I'm in the intermediary phase before I cross that finish line. The credits roll, and I smile for the rest of my life, and so you've invested, and that is, of course, the classic. The, the technique gets used in so many nefarious ways. The, the classic way is you go to buy a car and the dude, you, you're ready to buy. But you're like, can you come down a little bit on the price? And the guy's like, you know what? Let me go talk to my supervisor. And he vanishes for like 30 minutes. And you've been sitting there for 30 fucking minutes. You're getting steamed. Because you're like, what the fuck? It's a question. Like, you can't text him or something? Just fucking ask if it can come down or not, man. But what's really happening is they know if they make you sit in that fucking seat long enough, you feel more and more invested and committed to buying the fucking car. Mm. So you've been sitting in the seat of late stage capitalism. You've been really invested. You, yeah, sure, the political system's fucked up. But man, I'm telling you, it still works. And yeah, sure, there's some bad people out there, bad apples in the world. But ultimately, there's no fucking way that the people running the show are murderous, greedy people who just are sorcerers and want to get more and more power. You're out of your mind. What are you talking about, Alex Jones? You're crazy. And and and, and because if you start subscribing to any of those things, even in light, light ways then suddenly whoa dude you're out of sugar mountain now you're in fucking like now you're in the swamp of the unknown you don't have the map anymore because the map was fucking wrong and people figured out the map was wrong for millennia they've known the map is fucking wrong and those people come along and have some way of saying this map is totally wrong it's off and they all and they get crucified they get fucking it rejected for for most of them so you know what i mean like that is the yeah Fuck that. Fuck that. Yeah. Fuck that. Enjoy Sugar Mountain, by the way. Do it. Enjoy. Like, go for it, man. I mean, I think there's something really kind of hardcore about the true adherence to the norms of default reality. I think if you look at that as a cult, which it most certainly is, mm-hmm. I feel the same way I used to feel, you know, sitting next to a Hare Krishna at 4 a.m. in a Hare Krishna temple whose head is shaved and who's wearing robes and who's reading out of the Srimad Bhagavatam while someone blows a conch shell. And, and, you know, in the sense of, but the difference is the Hare Krishna has, is, knows they've engaged in a process that is designed to uh, evolve them. Whereas the default reality, the adherence to default reality, they don't, they don't realize that they are actively engaged in a mm-hmm. nonstop series of rituals that has been prescribed to them by people they'll never fucking meet who are running totally. the show no you nailed it i mean i was reading uh i was reading a the miles davis autobiography last night c- because you know it's so beautiful to to try to time travel into the 40s fuck and yeah and i was just thinking about that like why am i so addicted to the past you know the, to the 40s and the 50s and 60s and 
And it's because, like back then, you might you might willingly join a cult. <laughs> it's like it's like kind of fun. Yeah. But now you're not joining the cult willingly so much. I mean, it's a, it's the same fucking thing. It's obviously much worse back then because you're really. But it was like a fun practice. Like these guys sound like they're saying some really interesting things. Right. You know. Whereas now it's like everybody in the cult, it's become so much more subtle. You know, so it's kind of harder to convince people of it. And I think uh, kind of because it's such a good illustration, I'm going to resort to the Logan's Run thing again, which I I did in our last podcast. But but imagine, you know, that you are inside the biosphere in the safe place where they're offering you all these fruits of uh, all these rewards. You yeah. Know? digital prostitutes come through you know this beaming thing and yeah. the best food just beams into your food into yeah. your into your room and all this stuff and you're going to get reincarnated and then like you're looking through the surface to the outer world where i'm at essentially in a world of like it's kind of like hell you know it's burning it's, yeah. it looks like it's the desert it's christ in the desert as you're painting that you describe and and like I am out there and and for you to to leave the biosphere for you to leave the cult there has to be something that I suggest to you that's completely convincing uh, that there's some great reward out there. Yeah. But you are inside of the place where all the rewards are. And you lo- you're looking through the plate glass window at me out in what looks really unfun, you know, like yeah. this this place to go die. And so there has to be some reason why you would want to abandon all of those good things, reincarnation, all the things they're offering you inside this biosphere uh, that, you know, that makes you want to transgress, that makes you want to go out there and become like, you know, a survivalist, you know? And, and so technically something about that, that room, you coming into my room, realizing that I wasn't actually a total dick. I mean, there were days where, I look back and people were like, wow, you are a complete asshole. And I'm like, I must, I must have been being one because I just, I, I can remember that reality that I was probably in that zone. But then together we go into this room and we, we perform the calls. You leave the room initially feeling, feeling guilty. But then as, as, as life goes on and you kind of, you judge the transgression emotionally, you start to realize like, Maybe outside the biosphere, you know, where I'm standing in hell, uh, there's some true, there's, there's a, a deep truth to it that like a deep truth that w- that's within you that you cannot avoid. You know that, what I mean? That, dude. Yes. And then you see what I'm saying, absolutely, man. Yeah, for sure. And you, it's just like you're saying about the music or any other thing. It's like, you know, if you've never been to a desert, by the way, it's like, and you've only seen movie versions of deserts. When you get out to the real desert, it's fucking beautiful. It's like one of the most beautiful places you've ever seen in your life. That's actually one of the first cool things about going into an actual desert for the first time, is that you realize everything you thought about the desert was wrong. That not only is it, yeah, is it is it like there's fucking, like there's not water, it's a fucking desert. There's cacti, there's things with thorns on them everywhere. But there's a general vibe. I mean, there's a reason that one out of five people you run into at Joshua Tree are on mushrooms. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, they're either mushrooms or they're models going to lay on a rock. Uh, but the or both maybe. The, the point is like that's the other thing is like you know you you the whatever the thing is in the deep end you can't know it until you go there that's the leap of faith and the uh, the the uh, to me like that the the, something there's something really delightful when you start realizing that oh it's beautiful here like this is supposed to be like is it safe no the desert is the fucking desert safe it's no you're gonna fucking die you're dead meat if you don't you're (laughs) dead you're probably gonna die if you're lost out there but like is it is it a pleasure palace? No, it's not a fucking pleasure palace. But then that's when you start realizing the pleasure palace is 
a, a, everything's the desert. And the Pleasure mm -hmm. Palace is the most insidious form of desert in that it tricks you into thinking it's this opulent place of safety and food and whatever the fucking thing is that you're buying into. And yet, in the Pleasure Palace, just like the desert, people just drop dead. People get <laughs> murdered. People burn to death. You know, people get arrested for breaking the rules of the Pleasure Palace. People get arrested who haven't even broken the rules and just fucking knew something they weren't supposed to know. The Pleasure Palace is as dangerous as the desert, but because it doesn't look like a desert, you don't guard yourself in the same way you do in the desert. You don't realize that you're in a sacred space as much as the desert is a sacred space. And so, and so that's why in the Pleasure Palace or whatever, Sugar Mountain, you're in a lot more danger than you are in the desert. Because at least in the desert, you know there's no water here. You're not going to find food. There, it's going to be hard. And the, the, in, 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 the Ple in Sugar Mountain, it's the same fucking thing, but you look at yourself and you're like, man, I'm failing. My life is, I just must not be doing something right. I just must not have what it takes. I don't have the X factor or whatever it's, the fuck it sounds they tell like, you. Uh, you sound like you're describing a soldier, you know, that went off and went through all these horrible things but learned all these, like, sort of core lessons, comes back to, you know, America and, and is, is just put through sort of like this weird culture shock where they're not enjoying the Pleasure Palace and they're like, they just kind of get so confused in a Jacob's Ladder way and they're just like, let me go back. Let yeah. Let me go back to, to the war. shit. <laughs> go back to the shit. Get back in there, man. That was when I was alive. That's when I felt. And it, and again, like this, in any parent knows that the 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 people who judge parents or or the cur current you know, culturally fashionable thing is to say like I'm not gonna fall for that shit. Have kids. I'm not gonna fall for that. Look at them trapped. Look at them fucking trapped in hell. <laughs> I'm free. Uh, but anyone who's had kids knows they're right in some way. Their analysis <laughs> is correct. Yes, you are way way more free than I am in a in a in a kind of like um su superficial way in the sense that you if you want to fucking like stay up till 5 a.m getting blasted on a Thursday you can do that and you don't have to get up in an hour to take your kid to school and you don't have you know little little humans around you depending on you not going fucking insane and being like emotionally stable as much as possible so that they don't like so, so that they don't have to like you know turn into like hypersensitive adults who had fucked up parents and now they like they're like little fucking squirrels in the forest every moment looking at any sign that their daddy's gonna smack them or whatever like that's a, what you could do but you know what i mean so so but you know the parenting is a desert and <clears throat> you're out there in that fucking desert and you're waking up early and, and you've read, oh, in a spiritual life, you wake up early. In a spiritual life, you wake up early and you fucking pray. You wake up early and you like are selfless. You give. And but that's you've just you you wake up in the monastery. You're like, I joined the monastery. I'm gonna do this. With kids, it's like, no, dude, you gotta do it. You have to. There's no fucking choice anymore. You have no choice now, or unless you're a monster. So that is a desert. And what I'm saying is this fantasy that convenience mm -hmm. equals happiness mm -hmm. is one of the most destructive fucking fantasies in the modern world. And it's horrific in the horrific <laughs> in the sense that the the corporations who have so much fucking money, they trumpet this bullshit dream to mm -hmm. sell cushions, to sell phones to sell laundry detergent and fucking Doritos so they, they 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 send out the hypnotic sermon of materialism every time they make a commercial look look at how happy they are man look at that see their joy don't you want it and then you know what I mean and that gets in people's heads and now their their whole life is spent pursuing a hypnotic lie injected into them by vampires who are inviting them to transform their life energy into 
dollars and then give them life energy units because they think they don't think they're buying a fucking car they think they're buying the next phase of their life they don't you know what i mean they don't think they're fucking buying the the new clothes just because they need to wear something they're like this is the new me now i'm free now i am the new me just like in the commercial the fucking sneakers they're buying those fucking sneakers because they want to be healthy and and they think if they have the sneakers, they'll start exercising. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's <laughs> fucking evil, baby. And that's the other thing. The fucking Sugar Mountain is run on blood. Sugar, <laughs> sugar Mountain is fucking. You want to, That's the other funny thing about it is these motherfuckers are so superstitious. You know, they're always like, you know, they, I'm literally crossing themselves. But they're so superstitious of people like you, you fucking Satanist. And... And, 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 and when you really look at w what they're up to and what's going on, you realize like, oh my God, from a kind of, from a, a, a sort of mythological perspective, they are living in the kingdom of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. They are probably worse than the ancient Babylonians who are sacrificing children. Because again, if you're taking a kid and throwing it in a fire, which is already horrific, at least you're doing it because you're like, I worship Baal, this god of darkness. But it if you're like, like there's, you, there's you, you know, probably there's, like sorry, a legal, there, it seems like there's a, like a legal defense for capitalism in the sense that they probably are able to get away with this because they can. Pr there's a clause at the end of the line that says like, well, you were too, st you were so stupid that you bought this, you know what I mean? And then they kind of like, they get absolved in the sense you've seen this in, in many, many d true crime shows where like the person taking everybody's money effectively gets away because the people voluntarily gave it to them. Yeah. This episode of the DTFH was brought to you by VB Health. When I was approached by VB Health for their amazing supplement, Load Boost, I was skeptical. I'm going to be honest. Uh, I did not know that it was possible to make yourself blast more than however you're blasting. And by blast, I mean spray cum. And so... I knew I well, I, I'm gonna have to take this. I'm gonna have to follow the prescribed course of this supplement and see what happens. Does it change the consistency of my loads? Scientific and also interesting to me because how does that even work? Now, Load Boost contains a blend of pygium, zinc, lectithin, and more. And there's a good reason why, why Load Boost is the favorite supplement of adult film stars that have to spray a lot. Because I don't know if you've ever watched any prawn that has a weak blast. And it's not like, you know, it, it's somewhat like, it's just, you feel like when you're watching a movie and they, they like didn't have the budget they needed, you know, like. Isn't that guy supposed to, like, explode a, a volcano of semen here? Like, what's going on? Is he okay? Is he healthy? So they have to take this stuff. They have to take this stuff to make sure that they can do their jobs. Regardless, I tried it, and it works. It really works. And wow, that's a remarkable thing when you're a 50-year-old man and suddenly you're realizing all the teenage problems you've completely forgot about, which was like jerking off. It wasn't just like, you know, dab up some sad droplets of jizz and you're done. Like you had to get like a towel. It was a mess. So load boost. I tried it. It works. Visit LoadBoost.com, use code DUNCAN for 10% off, or click the link in the episode description. That's LoadBoost.com, 
Use Duncan for 10%. And I forgot to mention, it Im apparently improves the taste of your cum. And I have not tested that yet. But I'm thinking about it. Maybe I will. I don't know. I don't know. It's a lot, man. That's a big commitment, like to eat your own cum. It's weird to think, like, of all the things we eat that come out of our bodies. Jizz, you're not supposed to eat that. And swallow your snot all day long. Hmm. Thank you, VB Health. Yeah, oh, dude. I mean, so whose fault is it in the end? Whose fault you know? is it that some dumbass thinks they can fly and jumps off a cliff? It's not the fucking <laughs> cliff's fault. I mean, if the natural world and the laws of the natural world are universal realities that get converted into some kind of linguistic, cultural grid, then there is never a stupidity defense Unless you're like an, an infant, maybe. But in mm. general, this is like, dude, you got to watch the Ashley Madison documentary. I'm sorry. I talked about it on an earl earlier <laughs> podcast. But so there's various cheaters on it. And it's really cool to see the, the different types of cheaters. There is the like unrepentant cheater. Yeah, I fucking fuck around, man. Whatever. There's that. And there's real virtue in that kind of cheater. I know it's wrong and I'm going to do it because I want to virtue. Right. And then there's the polyamorous cheaters where the guy's like, uh, yeah, my wife lets me fuck other women, but I have to get her permission. And also she's a dominatrix who pegs dudes every day and we fucking love each other virtue in that from that perspective there's no deception happening and also in there they're like freaks and they fucking love it so great but then you get this the mystery unto oneself cheater which is what this one guy is so the so this is of all the forms of evil the most vile because this guy somehow with a straight face is like you know i was just going on ashley madison i didn't even know what i wanted i was talking to these women and i knew i'd meet up and i'm like what could happen here really like i just didn't really even know what i was doing and it's like dude you you pay taxes you have a job you pay a mortgage you drive you walk you read you can do math and you expect me to believe that when you went on Ashley Madison, you didn't know you're going to be balls deep in some fucking lady. <laughs> like you really thought that wasn't going to happen. Cause like, like, so it's like mystery under oneself tricks does self deception to fully experience the hedonic peak mm -hmm. without guilt, you know, or with a sense of like, I'm still a good person, but Oh my God, but I, there, this is all just a, con this is a confusing mistake that I should be mouth fucking this lady at a day's end. And, you know what I mean? And I, to me, that, that is why I do not think it's defensible. There is defense against it, though it would be nice if there were. I don't know. I'm not saying like they're all going to hell on Sugar Mountain. I'm just saying if you have the slightest glimmer underneath all of the conditioning that something is amiss, then... Now it's your fault. Now you are participating in your own mediocrity and destruction, and but you're a coward, and so you don't want to admit the participation is happening. That would be my analysis of it. Well, let, let me ask you. By the way, let me just say this. I'm sorry, yes. Emil. If it's going to be so funny, I now wish we'd done this before. I wish that the prank call we were going to play was us calling someone being like, is your refrigerator running? <laughs> <laughs> like if this long spiritual setup was for just like the stupidest prank call. No, I Too mean late. I think it it ultimately actually ends up being the one we're, we've talked about playing uh, ends up being incredibly positive in so many in so many ways. But I was going to ask you since since we're talking about the the precipice of like being introduced to sort of like 
you could call them occult truths, but like the beyond good and evil sphere, or whatever. If you if you're talking about that precipice, had there has there been a time in your life where, and you don't have to even go down this road, but it'll spur you onto something. Um, obviously, we survived that collision, and we and we yeah. to this day are are like stronger for it and all that yeah. stuff. And we're we're happy and happy that we know each other. But was there ever a person you came up against and you saw that they were powerful and you saw that they were above the code and and sort of like living in a in a, on a different strata, and they actually kind of did slash you and hurt you, and that actually created some um, hmm. you know tension in the script for you. You know, I'd have to think about that one for a little bit. It's such a good question. First of all, it's very rare to run into people like that. That's one thing, like incredibly mm -hmm. rare. And also sometimes people like that don't feel like, you know, even like, you know, being known. So there are some people like that I fantasize stay invisible on purpose as they sort of you know, try to get a gauge on who the fuck you are and if they even want to deal with whatever you are. You know what I well, mean? Because you have to be an appropriate victim that they can get something out of efficiently. But you, you've you talked about this concept several times now that I look back. You, you've talked about how people make the mistake of thinking s that someone, if they're a wizard or a magician, that means they're, they're good. Oh, no, yeah, because someone can you know demonstrate I mean? some kind of city because someone mm -hmm. can demonstrate some sort of ability, which, by the way, isn't like necessarily Jedi tricks. But, you know, you could say a city uh, if you've ever been around a very fascinating person and you realize that like a lot of time has passed and you've been drawn into this person's aura. That's a city. That's an, an, a, a, an example of some kind of like potentially unperfected instinctual power. And so mm -hmm. so these can be developed apparently and um or just via like being out in the desert long enough suddenly access to these things becomes like uh, easier for s certain people and that would be the beginning of magic that would be the beginning of you know this is the look at the magician tarot card you know the someone who mm -hmm. is like organized the elements is no longer the fool going off the cliff which is sugar mountain the next tarot card after the fool is the magician as this evolution happens and so yeah but just because somebody has developed some kind of spiritual quality does not in any way shape or form indicate morality especially like western like uh you know the ethics of the western world and this is where people run into do you remember in dharamsala dude this is one of the funniest fucking things you know in dharamsala god who told me this so there are all these like you know dharamsala is the um uh place where a lot of the uh, tibetan diaspora ended up and tibetan buddhism is tantric buddhism and so there's a shamanic element to it. And I don't know if this is true or not, but someone fucking told me, in, I think in Dharamsala, that what happens is these fucking tourists come through, these women come through, and they meet like a hot Tibetan dude who also happens to be a tantric master. Mm -hmm. And they get fucked in a way that they have never been fucked before. Like, it, it's like... It, it's like whoever was banging them in the West, that was like, that, that wasn't even sex. All of a sudden, like their chakras are being activated. They're remembering their past lives. They're, they're like coming out of their body. They're having like multiple, multiple, multiple orgasms. Everything they can see. I was meant to meet this person forever. And it's true. And then they don't leave they get sucked in apparently there's people out there and probably in other parts of the world that have actual just like essentially harems of women that they have like that they have like uh uh like fucked into like some kind of semi-enlightened state mm -hmm. and um and and so like the the, the what what, what uh, happens i think in the west is some westerner has read shirley mclean or some shit and then goes to fucking india and meets like a Shaivite who drinks out of skulls, like who finds skulls and drinks 
blood out of skulls. And they expect that person to adhere to Western ethics. You know what I mean? And which I think to them must be hilarious. It must be the funniest shit they've ever seen because they didn't grow up in that system. They don't think sex is evil. They don't think that fucking is wrong. They're, they're in a totally different cultural dimension. Hmm. And the hubris of people in the West is that, is that, you know, I hate, it's, the word's been used so much, maybe it's starting not to mean as much. It's a colonizer attitude. It's like, I'm going to come hmm. over here, and because I'm nice and spiritual, I'm going to find an actual spiritual being and grow and they are going to follow my rules because i know what's at least i know what is right and wrong and the whole thing falls apart at that moment because if you knew then you wouldn't be going to fucking india to meet some guru so how do you think you know so you come you come over there with your bag of this is how you're supposed to act enlightened being you don't look happy that's not what a happy person does. A happy person doesn't raise the, the carcass of a dead child and bring it back to life temporarily and make it dance around in front of me in front of a fire. <laughs> Whatever the fuck it is they're doing, right? So yes, sorry, long answer, but truly, you're, you're, if you're around someone and they start demonstrating some spiritual potency and you think, oh great, they're going to be nice to me. Boy, are you in for a fucking wild ride because that's, Never, <laughs> probably never gonna happen. Well, I mean, you know, even though that sounded like it was gonna have a bad ending uh, to her, you know, initial idealist fantasy, it's still just the layers and layers of evolution in the sense that she's, you know, she's gonna have her fantasy um, deflated, you know, and then that's gonna be some form of of growth. And then whether you go to Nam, whether you come back. Uh, no matter where you are, you're going to keep coming back to the the truth that um, the labyrinth of self abuse is your own, you know, castle. You'll never escape. You know what I mean? Never shall you escape. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You it. don't go off to not. You know, you don't go off and 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 escape the the uh, the temptations. You know, essentially. But no, um, you don't. You don't. You carry your harem around in your head. And, there you go. And, and dude, I like that. That, uh, but again, that is also an outsider perspective because in, on Sugar Mountain, uh, the the game is that you're a victim. On Sugar Mountain, like you know, if some fucked up shit is happening to you, it probably is because you're a victim of the fucked up thing, you know, from big to small. And so in Sugar Mountain. You know, that's that's the, the concept of drive all blames into oneself is an outsider concept. It's like, no, I will not drive all the fucking blames into myself. No, this is happening to me because of my entanglement in a fucking fucked up system. And also because I'm neuro fucking divergent and because, you know, my fucking bone spurs. You know what it's like for me to walk? It's like walking. It's wa walking on razors, motherfucker. And you think that like like you fucking think it's my fucking fault that I, I got in a relationship with a monster? No. Do you, have you met my dad? Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. It's like, and, and nobody wants to hear it who's really bought into the victim thing because, again, victim, if you're a victim, then, like, you do get to have this kind of virtue about you. You know what I mean? You're surviving your victimization versus that you had somehow brought it on yourself in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds really callous because obviously the question would be, okay, yeah, but what about, are you saying like a fucking kid who got fucked, uh, who got like, murdered by their uncle, brought it on themselves? And I have no answer to that. And that is where the argument falls apart. And I've heard spiritual mm -hmm. people try to say it's because they chose that incarnation or whatever. I don't buy that. So I don't have a full answer for it. Maybe not everyone, maybe drive all blames into oneself isn't applicable to everybody. But a lot for me personally, subjectively, the times where I've really felt, like you said, that person got me. And mm -hmm. I look back, it, it, maybe the invitation to be hurt wasn't like in Dracula, where a vampire, the, the Dracula is like, do you enter into my mansion of your own free will? Which is like the vampire invitation. Maybe it was something much more subtle. But... Mm -hmm. 
still there was some piece of me that could have seen it that should have known and mm. it and thus my fault and and it seems like kind of a martial arts like distinction not that i am a pro or, but like somebody that if bruce lee just smacks you in the face yeah, the initial <laughs> the initial reaction is going to be like, why did you do that? That that was a terrible thing you did. But say you were frozen there for the rest of your life. You're just like, oh, he he crossed me, he betrayed me, he did yeah. this thing. But but someone on the path to becoming Bruce Lee is going to see someone with the spiritual hunger. Let's say um, is going to see like that the master hit me in this way to show me that this could be done and if there is a way to avoid it then i have to develop that yes there you go right? exactly and that is called in buddhism wrathfulness which is one of the approaches in transmitting the dharma is wrathfulness and wrathfulness you know isn't usually slapping someone in the face usually it's um telling someone the truth it's usually <laughs> just that and, and, and usually the way the truth is told is not like you can't handle the truth it's very right. what makes it wrathful is the delivery mechanism is quite often love and mm. so it's not just the truth it's a loving truth it's not the asshole who comes up to you and tells you your breath stinks and is happy because you're embarrassed it's a it's the it, with the intent behind telling you the truth is not to cut you but rather to cut something binding you that you that, that is hurting you but in the you, you think without it you're you, you can't survive and and that slicing away surgically by uh, uh, someone like that is wrathfulness and it's good but boy it don't feel good and and i'm sure it doesn't feel good to get slapped in the face by bruce lee and it <laughs> sure as fuck doesn't feel good to have someone like that tell you the truth if you've been in denial regarding some aspect of your character that is bringing you down. I think we've talked about this and you, I think you told me that there's, um, you know, that a great teacher understands the timing of telling the truth, that, that there's a version of telling the truth. I, I think there's a phrase you told me once, but it's so blunt and it's so off timed that it's actually just, it just induces pain. It doesn't induce growth. No growth. Nothing happens. It's useless. And that, that is the, on Sugar Mountain, traditionally, we tell each other the truth that is always mean. And there is not, it's always at the wrong time. And it's generally not benevolent, you know. And by the way, man, there, there's another thing that bothered me about you. Um, uh, and, Let's and, go down the list. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't care. Like, I mm. got the sense that mm. you were not encumbered by guilt in the way that mm. I was. Mm -hmm. And I got the sense that that was cheap. That, 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 and also I got the feeling of, like, should I want, and I, I didn't think this, like, in these exact words, but a sense of, like, you know, well, if he doesn't care and if he's going to be happy mm. regardless of phenomena around him, then I can no longer hurt him if I needed to defend myself. Right. You know what I mean? Like the, 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 uh, how do you get vengeance on someone who's happy regardless of whatever? And I don't mean that. I'm like, I'm like one day I might have to get revenge on that guy. But in the sense of like in a normal sort of relationship, the give and mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. within it is if I give you good things, you give me good things. If I give you bad things, you give me bad things back. And there's a give and take of these like either vengeance tokens or love tokens or whatever, this transactional thing. And if it balances out, great. And so when that is removed from the transaction, which is I, I don't know if I'm necessarily going to be able to give you happy tokens or pain tokens then now it's like, what are you? Some kind of fucking communist? <laughs> like, you, you know, you become right. like, you become kind of like, you you can't get lassoed anymore in the, mm -hmm. in, in you know what I mean? In the transactional, like, in a normal way of transactions, uh, hanging out with people on Sugar Mountain. There's a little element of that, and I, we probably won't go down this road, but there's a little element of that in both of our fathers, I think. Like, the, yes. this... The, the, in their eyes, you know, you could see they could kind of take you or leave you in a way, maybe. Um, and then that creates, you know, 
for a lot of people, lifetime of trauma. I just saw my dad as who he was. I didn't have any problem with it. Uh, it How often did it, you get to hang out with your dad? You know, I mean, like... It, only once a year at a certain point on or something like that you know which which you know would they divorce when i was two but but that's not that's not any great i have no great message oh hold on lost internet hold on email are you there i lost internet yeah. go back one minute and start over okay. well i i just i really have no great uh i, did, I shouldn't have brought up fathers but I, okay we don't way, have to talk about it no it's, it's just just a way that in which i think a lot of people experience that kind of coldness yeah but like but that thing you're talking about um i would say has been one of the major themes of of my life it, with friends and and things especially when i was younger and indefinitely it was a thing when when we met too is i was not really available for for a lot of the uh a lot of the time when i was younger and so people right. would sense that and then they would try to be mean to me to evoke some sort of reaction exactly and also looking for some sort of probably love but like in the wrong you know direction which would then make me pull away and disappear dude that is the one of the real tragic things man is like you realize like some people they want to if you are mad at them they think you love them you're concerned with them if you're mm. You know what I mean? So the the form of inner of, of attention is the flavor of the attention is not important as the as the attention, and yeah, and right. so then they try to like get some kind of like burst out of you because it confirms that you mean something to them, and it's, and and it's really sad, and it's a real misunderstanding I think of like what love actually would look like that that, that love. Is, as it actually is might be something that isn't um transactional and well and, and if you've ever like you know been on a date or something with someone where you see that the wires are crossed in that way where they're looking for negative attention and then you pull away or maybe you get a divorce with someone you've been with for 10 years um it is incredibly sad, actually, as you cut them loose because you need to, and they go drifting and hurling through the cosmos with this kind of this karma, you know, whatever. It is not fun at all, but like in the end, you have to, you end up having to protect yourself. And everybody's in that situation. Everybody's backs against the wall. If something toxic comes into their bloodstream, you got to get the fuck out. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of n nothing personal at that point, you know? Well, in, a, in the human to human, right? Like, yes. But what I like about the alleged guru situation is you, they won't cut you. They, they, they if you want, if you want to mm. not be around them mm. because it's too much, fine when you call them after years of not talking to them they pick up the phone like you didn't leave there isn't that well where have you been mm. oh well so now you're just gonna call me and everything's fine thing it's mm. immediate pickup and it's to like you know one of the names from neem karoli, ba neem karoli baba was uh i can't remember the tiger of something because like if he decided it was time for you he they would he would pounce on you and wouldn't let go but that didn't mean wouldn't let go like you can't leave the ashram, but wouldn't let go in the sense of like that connection was always there for your whole life. And even if you never talked or saw him again, it was there. And the in the the the, the other thing about the difference between that sort of thing you're talking about or the general like the way a lot of us are connecting to people and the other thing, the desert dweller people mm. uh, is that it's so subtle but powerful in that the significance of the encounter stays with you. You don't, you're not spending all your time thinking about a lot of people, but these people stick out in your head. Even if you only like spend an afternoon with them or something, you mm. keep going back to that afternoon, something important happened there and you, maybe you don't even know what that was. So that's another quality is like, you might meet these fucking people years before you actually like start engaging with them. You never, you never know, but they don't let go. They don't do the normy fucking thing of like, I'm going to teach you a lesson. And now you're going to learn that if you don't do what I want, I withhold love from you. Classic mm -hmm. trick. It's just always there. And then that is also intolerable because it's like, what, what the fuck? You can't just, 
love me no matter what. You can't be there for me no matter what. You can't just, what? That doesn't work like that. I'm bad. Don't you see? I'm a. There's also something weird about the way you, you painted the picture of the woman going to India is like, and choosing who's going to be her guru. Like, I feel like in the real world, the guru has to choose you too. Like, oh, yeah. has to like you back because the only way to really help somebody is to care about them. And if you're just, you know, a guru isn't just someone behind a, a bulletproof glass <laughs> right. partition as like next, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's a two way street. Yeah. There are a lot. I mean, it's a lit it, you're what's happening. I mean, like guru the name is like it really like that name is stigmatized for many good reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, but like the thing that we're talking about, God, who was it? Abraham Maslow, the actualized being, I think is what mm. he called it, because you couldn't say enlightenment back then. You weren't supposed to say love. So you would say unconditional positive regard. But the actualized being is alive for real alive, mm -hmm. maybe more human than you are. They're feeling everything. They're there, man. They're in it. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and. and that's what's wild about it is if you've been around people who have the general anesthetic of mundane day-to-day -day life on Sugar Mountain and then you meet someone who's not numbed down, it, that's the other sense of danger, right? Like they're not they, – they're, they, they seem to be like really awake, mm -hmm. like more awake than like they're supposed to be. And then, they, then oh, the next thing you would think is that means they're seeing things about me that I think I can hide from people. They're mm -hmm. seeing things in me that I hide, and I kind of think they might see those things, and I can't hide from them like I can other people. And then that's where the two paths diverge, because they do see those things, but they don't care, and they're not using those things to manipulate you. The other side where it becomes the sorcerer, they see those things, and they're going to use them to control you. Right. And that's where the two things part, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also like sort of like the the entryway, the peak experience, whether it's the tantric sex or the or the or the guru showing you real love for the first time is like is like a, you're sort of a converter in that moment where you could fall prey to like great addiction. Right. <laughs> because you're experiencing this amazing thing so fast and uh, this beautiful thing in the in the Miles Davis book last night, where he basically only ends up getting off of heroin because he's sort of like he hits bottom in so many cities, he ends up having to move to Detroit. And in Detroit, of course, of all cities, the heroin is cut so many times; it's so insanely bad that when he's shooting it up, it eventually just it just doesn't do anything at all. So he gets lucky in reverse, right? Because the pleasure palace wow. backfires. Stops working. Yeah, because because they fucking cut it so many times because of capitalism. <laughs> so it's kind of like he ends up being given this gift that the that the addiction it doesn't even yeah doesn't it doesn't get work. you off, and that's the goal. Yeah. yeah, and also the other thing is like the the general sort of and again you know we're myth I'm mythologizing a thing that I think. Uh, if it does show up, maybe it doesn't. Sh it doesn't show up. I would imagine it. I'm, just, I'm mythologizing something. I may. I'm. I'm. In, I'm sort of like uh, making a cartoon character here, um, of a guru or something like that. But the well, with Neem Karoli Baba, you know, that was a big thing he would do. You would get jowled, which meant leave. And at some point, with and like these hippies would hide from him when they thought they were gonna like get sent out of the ashram, but but he would do, everything he was doing wasn't based on like anything more than like now you know you're th this whatever it may be this person is doing what you're saying idolizing me or turning me into a drug or now this person needs to integrate whatever the fuck happened when, during their experience here and and go out into the world for a while and so like. I think that's the other thing is like if in an interaction with someone like that, you would have to imagine that the sense of like the magic going away and suddenly like, dude, they seem like a dick or why aren't they talking to me or what the fuck? 
you have to look at that as like, no, they're showing you something right now. Now you're mm -hmm. seeing how much you got attached to the idea of what they were. And mm -hmm. then fuck, that's not the, that can't be the destination, right? Like, truly. Um, dude, such a fucking long buildup to plug our Prankle album. <laughs> Are you kidding? We're fucking idiots. We have, like, we have an album of prank calls that's coming out on Monday. Uh, and the links are going to be down there. Um, or if you're listening to this, you can find it at, at my website, Um But um, this is a tape of, our fa of some of our favorite prank calls that we made during our friendship uh, when we were in college. And uh, they hold up. And finally, like, well, fi Emil, like, is a master of doing this stuff. You have, like, all you, the, the whole process that you've introduced me to is wild of, like, getting a tape made and all of this stuff. But we have tapes that are coming out on Monday uh, of these calls. And uh, the, I think there's a, what's it, um, what's it on the tape, Emil? You mean, like, the band, band camp? Band camp. It's going to yeah, be on yeah, band yeah. camp. And so I this mean, it'll be easy if you just essentially the record, the tape is called Insidious Mind Control. So if you go looking for Insidious Mind Control, that phrase is probably going to pop up pretty quick. Yes. Yes. And uh, this t this call that we're going to play for you uh, and we probably won't play the whole thing because it's like 10 minutes. Uh, this is this call of all the calls. Um, it's one of, for me, it's like a really dark call. And the backstory is I used to work as, I would take catalog orders at a place called Clifford and Wilson, this big warehouse. And you couldn't tell the difference between a call coming from your manager and a call coming from someone wanting to buy a cardigan or whatever. And so one night in Emil's dorm room, in the shadows, I we decided to try to call Home Shopping Network and see if they had the same system that they couldn't tell the difference between an outside and an inside call. And we were delighted to find out that indeed, there's no way they could tell the fucking difference, meaning I could pose as a manager and have like do a prank call as the, a manager calling some employee at Home Shopping. And so that's what this call is. Should we play it? Yeah, go for it. Yes, uh, this is Randy over in customer service. Yes, Randy. I've got a question for you. A customer calls, they're a little irritable, they maybe get a little vulgar. What's your reaction? Well, uh, you try to try and calm them down if you can. I mean, listen to them. Okay, pausing it there. So, <laughs> okay, so. That's all you get. That's all you, so that was a big moment because no hesitation, mm. no hesitation. She immediately subscribed to that Ranny, which is the name I use, not Randy, <laughs> Ranny. She immediately subscribed to the idea that Ranny in customer service was, was her boss somehow and immediately went right along with it. There was, wasn't even a moment of like, who? Rand Randy? So, here we, and that was really exciting when we realized, like, on the hook, immediately. To them. Then what do you do? Well, if they're using vocabulary, I mean, you don't have to take abuse. That's correct. You must let her know that, you know, um, she needs to, you know, try and find out what the problem is. What is the problem? Well, let's uh, do a case scenario. Okay. A person calls, they haven't gotten their order in time. Oh, yeah. And they're expecting it. Of course. Let's say it's for their birthday. Yeah. And they're a little upset because they didn't get what they needed. I know. What's your reaction? Well, you apologize, of course. And uh, hopefully it's going postal so you can say that uh, it's coming postal so we, you know, the postal can be delayed uh, because of the weather. You know, you try and calm them as much as possible. Um, there are no guarantees in life, you know. And people who think that they are, you know, they're being misled. And we just got to let 
but no on or bike. It can be, you know, slightly longer. What? Wait, do you tell them there's no guarantees in life? No, I'd like to, though. No, of course not. No, we all would like to, wouldn't we? <laughs> yes, we would. I mean, no. some of these people call you think they're just idiots. Well, they're lonely. I find a lot of them, and they want conversation. They want to yell at someone, and you just let them vent, you know, as much as possible. As long as they don't, you know, throw any vulgar at you, uh, you know, you don't need to sit there and take that, uh, or you let them know that, ma'am, if you'll calm down, I'll get your supervisor. It's like metaphorically, you just let them beat you to a bloody pulp. Well, kind of, you know, but not, not abusively. You know, you don't need to, if they're swearing at you, you let them know that you don't need to take this, and when they calm down, the police call back. And you can, you can even moderately humiliate them. Well, moderately, as long as they don't realize and let them know when you're, you know, but you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to be nasty. We can't afford to be nasty. Just say, say you could say a sarcastic joke, maybe, if they are... No, no, it's not too good to be sarcastic if you're being monitored. That will go against you. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Let's say someone calls. This is another case scenario. All right. A person calls. They're speaking with you on the phone, and they're upset because they're worried that there's a burglar outside. Okay. So we we won't talk. This is so that's the intro, right? And um, this episode of the DTFH is supported by Better Help. Friends, do you have some? self-care routine that you always stick to. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big thing like what I do, which is like every day I do 700 pull-ups and then run 25 miles, which is why I have to wake up at 3 a.m. But if I don't do that, uh, I feel a little off. But whatever your thing may be, it's interesting how sometimes in our day-to-day routines, we leave out what's going on here or in here. And this is where therapy comes in. You've heard me talk about this before on the podcast i have benefited so much from therapy i'm not embarrassed by it are you kidding me we have a neurological hard drive up here all our memories instincts habits ideas preconceived notions about the universe somehow synchronized by a mushy gray thing that apparently has an odor to it not to mention we have neurons in our heart Oh, my God. And I'm not like being some kind of scientific materialist here. I do think there's a spiritual dimension. But the point is, come on, man, you're putting on lotion every day. But are you really thinking about your internal life? And also, maybe you don't know what therapy is even like. You've seen some movies. You think you're going to get psychoanalyzed. It's going to be weird and freaky. But man, usually... Therapists are the most down-to-earth, awesome people ever. It's not what you think. And you don't have to go in there for some, like, you can go in there for specific reasons. It's not like you're going to be in there forever. My point is, if you're thinking about therapy, you should try better help. It's easy. It's super convenient. It's all done completely online. You just fill out a questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist. They make it easy to switch any time. And best of all, you can do it from your house. You don't have to drive somewhere. And for a lot of us who might look for any excuse to not do leg day or to go to therapy, that drive can be all you need to procrastinate. This way you can just do it from home and it works. It works from home just as much as it does in person, but you'll never know until you try. So try it out. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash Duncan and use code Duncan to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com forward slash Duncan and use code Duncan to get 10% off your first month. Thank you, BetterHelp, for supporting the DTFH. Okay, that's the intro. Um, 
Uh, it's weird. I, I didn't even remember her sounding so obedient. I guess that's where you started feeling guilty is like just like the, if somebody really falls for it genuinely. But slowly, as usual, by the end of it, I mean, she completely she is playing along with you and she's really enjoying it. And it, and it feels um, it doesn't feel in any way evil at all. No, but to me, the sinister part of it was, you know, like, first of all, the setting. I wish you guys could see the setting. Just picture like a, a fucking like satanic dorm room. There's a painting on the wall that I think you found at a thrift store. This cre remember that painting, dude? This like weird, creepy guy looking down at you. So fucked up. Yeah, and we called him Robert. Robert. And yeah. uh, it's late at night and it's dark. In the, it's, I just remember being really dark and glowy in there and and the way this is happening is like i'm sitting with the phone and then emil is holding a tape recorder next to the fucking phone and feeding me lines like and sometimes you'll hear him in here giving me lines but so it's in this like weird situation and then she's saying shit right away like uh there are no guarantees in life and people who've been taught that are being misled <laughs> and it, in the contextually. That's just such a creepy thing to hear some random person you're calling at home shopping network saying to you. And then also she thinks that you're her boss. And so it becomes magical at that point. Cause now that she thinks that you're her boss, she, there's just no telling where the call could go. Now this is a 10 minute call. Again, this is not, this is going to be on the next tape release, but the tape that we're about to put out has many calls like this on there. Like the quality, the the the, mm -hmm. the mood of the calls is inevitably something like this. That's the name, Insidious Mind Control. So yeah, the, that arc of that call is so long, and the payoff is impossible. I don't think you can play the whole thing. Right no, now anyway. but I could jump ahead a little bit to where it really starts getting fucking weird. Like you could, yeah, go like eight minutes in or something. Okay, eight but minutes. I, I, well, it's that's right. They do have an option. You know what the option is? What? Suffer or suffer, and why should we suffer? Do you know what I mean? No, I don't. Let me give you another example. There's a good man by the name of Adolf Hitler who once said, which means the lower, the lower are not the higher. Do you understand what that means? Yeah. The lower are not the higher? Yes. I think it's pretty uh, simplistic. It is very, but you know where the essence of wisdom is? Please tell me. Simplicity. Mm. I agree with that. Exactly. And that's what it's about. You, you, you're you doing an excellent job. Your superior calls to ask you a few questions. You're very kind to answer those questions because you understand about following orders. Is that right? I don't do it very well, but I understand the system, yes. And that's what it comes down to, following orders of your superiors. Uh, there you go on with superiors because I think there's only one superior. I don't like the term superior. Um, oh, you can call it what you like. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, terms. Uh, but, uh, yes, I think when you're in the workplace, uh, this is what they want, this is what you offer, and then this is what you do. That's sure. that, and it goes into life, for instance. Exactly. Yes. I'm not proud of it. It's just uh, I'm not a millionaire, so what do you do? I'm sorry? You're not a millionaire, so what do you do? You work. That's right. You work for your money. You work for your money. And you obey rules. Exactly. And you follow laws. Right. And you rise up in power. Perhaps. Well, if Lucifer's with you. Well, now, that's debatable. Well, we don't have to call it the powers of darkness, do we? We don't have to label it anything now, I suppose. I'm sorry? I don't think labels matter one way or the other. You can call it whatever you like. This is the age of enlightenment. We are entering an age of wisdom. Yes, we are. We're in there. Thanks to the powers of darkness. So I take it that you're a Lucifer uh, disciple? Yes, I am a disciple of the Dark Lord. <laughs> yeah. Why? Oh, it's, but I don't like the, I'm bored. <laughs> you gave Why? me that what? Well, the important thing here is not really to get into religious matters, but let, but to understand about our position in society. <laughs> that fucking call. That moment of like realizing like, you know, if someone's quoting Hitler, just get off the fucking phone. <laughs> wait, hold on. Wait, I missed it. God damn it. I had to stop. Wait, damn it. 
But that's all. Wait you're, one second. You're fine. Wait, wait, one second. Regardless, Sorry. You're fine. Yeah, that if someone's quoting Hitler, you should get off the phone and then to follow that with like and realizing that this person is a professed Satanist. <laughs> And she, she's just going, al- she's going, she's just going along with what, with it. You know what I mean? And adding to it that, to, that's why the, I think of that call as like sinister. Like, well, and you're not going to be able to, you know, someone listening is not going to be able to get the entire like, like beautiful rhythm of that call with just a couple snapshots. Like everyone that listens to that call essentially falls in love with her because yes. She she basically fences with you so elegantly and she wins every little round, you know, and she does it with supreme grace. And she's got that crazy like Kathleen Turner voice. Yes. It's like she's she's pretty incredible. I mean, spiritually very attractive, like the way she she kind of weaves and goes with you and then rejects you if she wants to, even though you're her boss. Yeah. She does it so, so sort of um, gently that that you have no choice but to just by the time you're done with this like 11 minute call, everybody just always feels like they've been taken on this ride that was, yes, it dipped into darkness, but she like she rescues it. It, yeah, in such a sort of life affirming way. Yeah, yeah, it for sure. And the, that was the, the just the other like thing with these calls that was astounding t- and still is to this day to me is how long we could keep people on the phone. That was the other weird part. And and she says that in the beginning. You know, people are lonely; they want to talk. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just such a sad assessment of the world of the modern world. People are so lonely that they're calling Home Shopping Network for some human connection. And like with these calls, like you you realize, oh, my God, that is part of it is like people just want to talk and the the, how quickly they can forget like their phone rang and they picked it up and they still don't know who this person is. Yeah, unconsciously they may they may sense your enthusiasm to speak to them and and that even like translates as a form of attention and love, you know. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's so yeah, the 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 calls um are like special, you know, in that in that in a way that I I don't know. And I know you're not supposed to say that if you're the one who made them, but like this is like 30 years ago and um <laughs> And it wasn't me. It was like you. It was like both of us. Like it was just this weird collaborative art project that made all these fucked up calls. Uh, and finally, we're going to like release them into the world for better or for worse. Yeah. In in collecting them in, into one tape, you know, I felt like there was a little bit of science and balancing the, the subject matter and the and the vibes. And you you got to have a little flash of violence every now and again yeah with the prank call that's just the nature of it but um but yeah this particular call is uh, would be like on the next tape which i assume would be the end of of the collection yeah that's it sometime we have enough for but two tapes i would say i think so i don't think i don't think there's probably if there are more there may be like pale pale versions of, of the great ones i don't think you could like and i wouldn't want to necessarily but i like the other thing is like you're capturing a, a time period too. Like, I mean, that's mm-hmm. the other thing is like th- you have to understand these calls were made before uh, cell phones. Right? Was there cell? There weren't cell phones, right? Like, this no. was pre-cell phone. This is the last days of like when you could call somebody and they didn't know what your number was. These were the last. This was the days where the phone was a physical object hanging on your wall in your house, and in 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 you know the. It was the the ability to like look up a number, who's calling me, all of that stuff. It just wasn't there. So it was the glory days of prank calls, man. It's it, you could people still do new forms of what you would call a prank call, but this was like this is analog, last days of prank call. Calling. Yeah, there's so many. There's a lot of layers actually. Not that we're gonna spend a lot of time on it, but like I never thought about the fact that back then you'd be charged for long distance, right? So we're yeah. inevitably 
like epitomizing and, and freezing in, in a time capsule our region, right? So right. our like little Asheville, Buncombe County, Swannanoa area right. is is capsulized forever. And and you could definitely theorize that, that people stay on the phone a lot longer there than they would in New York City. You know what I mean? They 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 are out up in the fucking mountains and they've got yeah. these incredible you know, legendary accents and personalities that that come from that area, and then they entertain and play with you. It maybe in a kind of classic Southern way, you know, like right. they're gentle and friendly, but they're kind of like they're enjoying it on a satanic level just to match you too. Yes, yeah, there is that too. There, the the, yeah, it it was certainly like it is a time capsule, and it is definitely like illuminates the the personality of the where we went to college <laughs> and but i also i think it like it that psychology still exists it's just being exploited in different ways you know it's like the 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 it's still people are like so willing to just like go along with shit that's the craziest part we're just so willing just to go we go we go along with it whatever it is it doesn't whatever it is like politically historically culturally like you just go along with it because you have to and you just do and that is such a fucking crazy place to live in live in that place like i'm just gonna go i guess i just go along with this and that i mean that's what you were testing the boundaries you're literally testing to see what she will say you know as an employee and she she effectively tells you i mean some of these people yes they're 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 funded by a, an exquisite loneliness and they stay with you yeah. because in a way you're you're kind of a new friend but but with her i mean she tells you the 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 ins and outs of how capitalism works throughout the course of that call she tells you i mean you heard it in that clip where she talks about the reality of just a working person and what else do you do you know and you, you're like well you follow orders you you start to kind of create the slippery slope into the nazi movement <laughs> and she but she kind of like diagrams the spiritual background of like how you live life as a good person it's like a fascinating overview of someone who actually has I would say like Christian morals in the old, the, the right. pure way. You know, right. she she actually kind of meets you halfway and shows you why it it works to have integrity. You know, but you know that buyer beware thing though. It's also just like buyer beware. We're fucking Home Shopping Network. You really thought that fucking like mechanical clam perfume bottle was gonna work? Fuck you, buyer <laughs> beware, bitch. It's Home Shopping Network. Fuck you. So even though maybe she did have that kind of Christian ethic, there was also a generalized disdain for the audience. A sense of like, hey, you do the fucking research. We're going to sell you garbage. It's Home Shopping Network. You know, that whole thing just was like, as I'm realizing, like, oh, my God. Like, this is, I guess, how we get fascism. <laughs> like, this is exactly the path of fascism. Just start off with fascism light. Then just be like, you know what? It's, ah. I'm a disciple of Satan and like, and, and you're going to do a, you, yeah, you don't have to call it evil, whatever makes you sleep at night, man, but it's evil. And like, just real, like in my own head, I'm like, Jesus Christ, it can't, it can't be this easy. If it's this easy to manipulate people, then we are doomed. Then fascism is the inevitable future of everything. There is no way to evade or escape it. Maybe it won't happen for a hundred years, but dude, it, it's our, it's the, path if, if people are not discerning enough and, and just accept like garbage as as truth we're fucked that was that to me is the other thing that's dark about that call it's uh, i mean the jerky boys are never going to give you those layers of like you know development with, within people opening themselves to like a weird it's kind of an art form for for you to to pivot without thinking i mean that's great one of the the thrills of watching duncan do this was knowing in his eyes that he had no idea where he was going no ever idea. and then him landing the trick every time and and just not i mean everyone that i invited over to the room to watch him do it was just absolutely confused by like how and it, like if you study the rhythm of his responses and how he hooks them back in 
it's not something that can be taught or practiced. It's just, it's, it's literally like you're that present. You're actually uh, transcending, mocking someone. You're there with them in this strange right. way. There's something very unique about these calls, but like just the flip, just the pivot of you saying, you know, there was this great man named Adolf Hitler that, that said this thing, you know, the lower and not the higher. And for her to just trounce you, just throw down on you with a well, that seems really Pretty simplistic. Simple. Like that's yeah, you you so you're unevolved. Like you're you're trapped in this developmental stage. And then but for you to counter with <laughs> the well, essence of you, wisdom. Do you know what the essence of wisdom is? I mean, that was that was just as acrobatic, if not more insane, to, to actually be kind of bizarrely right and, and lead <laughs> her into a trap and say simplicity and she's like well, you got me there. You know, I mean, <laughs> that that's the kind of thing that I think does age well, where you come back to it again and again. And those lines will will stick with you for the rest of your fucking life. You know, dude, that also the weird sound when we ta start talking about Satan, there was some weird rustle. Maybe it was the tape player, but it's almost like just this this ambient like ksh, 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 as though to <laughs> emphasize the, the, how off the tracks the call was going. Anyway, look, maybe we're like blowing smoke up our own asses here but we love these fucking calls you can find them wherever look up insidious mind control email hot thank you for letting me take up so much of your time uh, and thanks for doing the show man yeah i'll talk to you very soon talk to you soon bye that was Emil amos everybody insidious mind control call 1-800-73 1999 if order first 50 callers order right now we'll receive a seven hairball collection made by matisha matone the hairball artist of paris make sure you call right now this offer is a limited offer and will not last much longer also come see me do stand up and a big thank you to my dearest sponsors thank you for listening or watching bye